Hi everyone, we're here again at Coney Lake Bark Park where we use as our base for many of the programs we've done for Armstrong and today we're going to do part two of a program that was so very, very popular with everyone who was able to see part one which was about the bluebirds and with my guest with me today is Mark Gritke who is the bluebird authority I think in western Pennsylvania. How many, how many bluebird houses have you put up? Well, it's over 300. It's around 320. And where are they mostly? Uh, in Venango County, Crawford County, and I got some up in Erie. Perfect. Okay. Well, why, what's the need to do another program here? Well, I think it would be important to instruct potential bluebird landlords, people that want to help bluebirds, on the importance of monitoring your bluebird box once the nesting season starts. I come across so many people that put up bluebird boxes and then they never check them again. They think, oh, we can't go in there, we can't touch the box, we can't touch the nest, we can't even look inside or we'll scare the bluebirds away. But it, it's been shown that unmonitored bluebird boxes are rarely successful. In fact, many of them become nothing but death traps. So it's very, it's very important, it's critical, in fact, that you monitor on a regular basis your nesting bluebirds. And what I want to do today is give everybody an idea of some of the things to look for when they check the inside of their bluebird box. And if, if anything, if you get anything out of this video, please come to realize that it's okay to look in your box and to touch the nest and make sure that the eggs and the nestlings and everything is okay. Which is a lot different than a lot of other bird species, different birds, because certain birds you can't do that with. Well, I don't know of any birds that will abandon their nest if you touch oh, really? it. Or, yeah, okay. I don't know any. I think it's, I, the parental instinct is so strong that it just doesn't make sense for a pair of birds to abandon oh, okay. their nest just because that. you touch them. All right, where are we starting today? What are we, what are we gonna see first? Well, we're gonna see first, this is your box here behind the trailer mm -hmm. at, at the bark park. It's box number two. And you can see it's the same pattern that I showed you in the first video. It has the baffle on it on a three quarter inch conduit pole. And that's my Troyer box. And we're gonna take a look to see the inside of the box. There should okay. be a nest in there with some eggs that haven't hatched yet. Now, Mark, whenever you stop at our place quite often, I think you stop because you want to get pretzels and things like that. <laughs> but anyway, the networks, that's a good trade. But you actually keep a record of every box that you stop and check and what the stage is of the, if there's eggs, if they're like nesting or whatever right. they are. So you keep a constant record of everything. All season long. It's, it runs four months from April to August. April, May, June, July, actually five months is the, is the nesting season. Uh, bluebirds generally quit laying eggs after July 15th, okay. but even those that do before or on that day, they will raise their young all the way to the end of August. So the nesting season for bluebirds is about five months long. And I do record everything I see. I have data sheets for all of my boxes, all 300 boxes. And on that data sheet for each box, I record what I see in the box, whether there's eggs in there or just a nest. If there's eggs, how many eggs are in there? If there's nestlings, how many nestlings? And then I determine how old the nestlings are. If a, a landlord is doing a good job, and if nature and everything is in place the way it's supposed to be, and weather cooperates, which it always doesn't, how many times in the course of a summer, or how many different sets of birds should you have or be able to get in a box, of, in a bluebird box? Uh, bluebirds will raise two clutches a year, and that's a given, pretty much, unless you have what I call natural disasters, like a cold spring, right. or if a flying squirrel gets in the box and destroys the eggs or the nestlings. If everything goes good, in a perfect world, bluebirds can ra will raise two clutches every nesting season. Can they ever do more than two? They can do two. On occasion, they'll do three. If the spring is cooperative and the weather is okay, they can start early in early April, get their first clutch out, and then in, in late May or early June, they can get the second clutch out, and usually they'll have a week or two in the before July 15th that they can start a third clutch. And I have seen third clutches in Pennsylvania being raised successfully. It's not a common event, though, but it does happen. Okay, but now let's talk again about the monitoring. But the other thing that I think you do, and I think I remember this, I try and remember all the things you tell me so I become a good landlord, but the landlord has to keep track of when the babies are born and when they're gone and when you, you've got to clean out the nest before the next one gets in there. That's right. That's one of the things that we'll talk about today right. as we look at various boxes. After the first clutch has fledged, you want to clean out that old nest. You want to take it out. Okay. And then in a week or two, the female will come back and she'll build a new nest. 
right. you want them to build a new nest and the female wants to build a new nest too. She doesn't want to lay eggs in an old nest because it could have parasites like blowfly larvae, for example. Okay. So you clean out that old nest. So that's the, thing. the other thing that you check all the time too is to make sure that the nests are in good shape and there's no parasites or anything right. going on. Right, and okay. hopefully we'll see a nest today that does have some parasites and the most common parasite and the one that is a, a biggest concern for bluebird enthusiasts is the blowfly larvae. Maybe we'll see it today. Hopefully we'll see some larvae today and we'll show how to deal with those larvae. And the larvae are are not your typical larvae. The female blowfly lays her eggs in the nest and they hatch in a day or so. And the larvae then hide out in the nest at the bottom of the nest. And at night, the larvae, also known as maggots, will crawl up to the top of the nest and attach themselves to the baby bluebirds. Oh, heavens. And after they do that, they create a wound on that baby, either on the leg, on the developing wing feathers, or on the feet. They drink that blood that flows from that wound all night long, and then at dusk, or at at dusk, they'll migrate down back into the nest again so the parents don't see them. Oh, more. My so, heavens. Okay, well, let's go over and see what we have in the first box all right. here. Now, they all have a, what, the old Phillips uh, screwdriver on the one side? Yes, that's how okay. I'm right-handed, so I put my screw that holds the front panel up on the top right. Okay. And when I loosen that, I use this because I check so many boxes that my hand would be pretty much numb by the, <laughs> the end right. of the day if I didn't have something like this helping me out. So I just loosen that screw and the front panel is lowered, and here you can see the bluebird nest. Nests are made primarily of two things, dry grass or white pine needles. And only the needles from white pine are used to build the nest, and okay. they got to be dry. Time out. What if I open the nest, and I'm just at the beginning of the season, and I see a lot of twigs? Is it a if bird? it's a lot of twigs in there, it's probably a house wren that's okay. taken over, over your nest So it's got to be this combination. What did you say again? Grass and? Grass and dry pine needles from okay, the white gotcha. pine. Okay, gotcha. Okay. And it's usually woven. Females are really good engineers, and you can see that they ha she has that woven in kind of a circular pattern in the front that you can see. That's your typical bluebird nest. Okay. So we can take the nest out. It's okay. And inside we can see that there are four eggs in the nest. And that's a typical clutch size for this time of year, Sue. In the spring, interestingly, they lay five or six eggs, but in the summer like this, they lay Four, usually four, three or four eggs. Oh wow, I never so, knew that. So clutch size actually decreases as the year progresses. And we don't really know why, because it makes more sense to lay fewer eggs in the spring right. when there's less food, and to lay more eggs in the summer like this when the weather's been warm mm -hmm. for a longer period and there's more, there's more food available. Okay, now it doesn't hurt to take that, that nest out of there. You can take the nest out and you see the eggs. This is the full complement of clutch, four eggs. Okay and record that on, a, on your notebook. If you only have one or two boxes in your yard, it's easy to do. Just record what day you saw the four eggs, and, and then, then you, put can, it back in again. you can put them right back in the box. How long has it taken to hatch? It takes 13 to 14 days for eggs to hatch. And okay. that's a good point because when the eggs, when the eggs get ready to hatch, you're going to want to look in. I would advise looking in the box on a daily basis. And that's not going to bother the bluebirds? That's not going to bother the bluebirds. All you can do is, if they hatch in 13 or 14 days, and you know the eggs are 10 or 11 days old, for the next few days, just peek in the box mm -hmm. and see if the eggs hatch. You don't even have to take the nest out for that. You can just peek in. If the eggs haven't hatched, just check the next day. The day the eggs hatch is critical to know because that will allow you to determine how old they are for the rest of the time they're in the nest. Okay. On the day they hatch, bluebird nestlings are referred to as day one nestlings. On their second day of existence, they're referred to as day two nestlings. Even though they're really only technically one day old on day two, they're called day two nestlings. Okay. It's, just a, it's just how we categorize the age of birds and nestlings. On day three, they're two days old, but they're in their third day of life. <laughs> Okay? So that's the pattern they use. And it's important to know that for two reasons. Number one, when they reach day 13, the nestlings, when they reach day 13, you don't want to open the box anymore. Because at day 13 and beyond, the nestlings, if you open the box and startle them, they might jump out. 
Uh oh, that's you, not good. That's not good at this at, because when you try to put them back in, they may not stay in the box. Once they taste freedom, it seems they just want to keep coming up. <laughs> so don't open the box when they reach day 13. Day 12 or less or younger is a good time to check for parasites and things like that. So if you know what day they hatch, you know what day they will be day 13. And that's the day you don't want to open the box anymore. Okay, now we're going to the next box, right? Well, I want to say oh, one more thing. Sorry. The other thing, <laughs> the other thing about the importance of knowing how old they are is they're going to fledge around day 17 to 19. So when they get to that time, when they get to that age, you probably don't want to use your loud lawn tractor and mow around the box because that could scare them out. And you don't want to, you know, really, you really don't want to bother get near the box too much at that age because you don't want to spook them out before oh, they're I ready didn't know to that. fledge. Okay. Well, people so, spook them out. What if people are standing here looking and looking and looking? That doesn't really have that to That really be... doesn't bother them. You really okay. have to open the box and do some kind of commotion to scare them out. Okay, gotcha. So it, it's okay. But a loud tractor, I'm always leery of loud tractors. And I had a case where a guy had a fireworks party in his yard when he had a bluebird box that of nestlings that were old and they jumped out of the box and they were all dead the next morning so you want to be careful okay and you can be more careful and you know when to be careful if you know precisely the age of your nestlings okay so it's it's a good thing to know what day they hatch because after you know that day you know how old they are how old they will be for the rest of the time they're in the nest box all right on to the next okay let's do it all right <laughs> Okay, Mark, we're ready for the setting. Tell us what we're looking at here All right, and tell this us is, what's happening. This is box five at the Bark Park. It's kind of set back a ways from the, the doghouse and the trailer. And there's going to be some nestlings in here, and they're going to be day nine. So at day nine, it's okay to open the box and take a look on the inside and see how the nestlings are doing. Is that her flying at us? Yeah, there's a, one of the adults is scolding us for getting close, but we're not going to be here long. We're just going to do a nest check see how the nestlings are doing. You always put your hand in to make sure nothing falls out. Do I, I need to hold that thing? No, that's fine. Okay. Oh well, yeah, if you want to grab that, just in case there's blowfly larvae in here, oh, we yay. can use that to see them. Oh yay. Oh my God. Yep, there's one larvae in there. This is, is that not, that little, that, that that's little that thing, thing there. right there, yep. And you can see, I'm going to just scrape the bottom of the nest a little bit. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's a whole bunch. Well, there's not many. That's not I a heavy infestation, but we'll, at least we can see what they look like, okay? Okay. Can I show them? Will you be able to see Yeah, them? these are day, these are day nine. Let's look at them first, then Bluebird we'll look at There's four in here. Oh, my God. And look, they're sleeping. They're going to just kind of snuggle down and and hide out. They got their eyes closed, even though they can open them and see. They, it seems like when they close their eyes, it means that nobody can see them. They're like little kids that way, but. Okay, now I'm gonna just gently nudge one up and see. I usually like to check to see if there's any blowfly larvae attached to the nestlings. Do we need to be closer, Mr. Cameraman? We're good, okay. Okay. Uh, sometimes you'll see blowfly maggots attached to the nestlings even during the daytime. Oh God. And so I like to check them and then uh, if I do find them attached to the legs or feet or wings, then I like to pull them off so that I can get rid of them, get them out of the nest. My God, aren't they cute? They're beautiful. They look healthy. There's a little bit of fat underneath the wings. You can see the yellow, the yellow fat there. Oh my Lord. And that's a good sign. That means they're getting fed pretty good. She's watching us. She's watching. Okay, it looks like they're going to get a clean bill of health. Okay, gonna... do, we, do we have to clean anything out in here? No, the larvae will be, usually the larvae will fall right out. That's why I like that sloping floor, by the way, yeah. Sue, is the larvae will, they tend to concentrate at the lowest point in the nest. So oh when I God. lower that, the larvae, the maggots will fall out. How old are these? These, gar these guys are day nine. Oh, wow. And they fledge around day 18, so they're going to be in the nest box for about... Another week or so. Another week, yeah, eight or eight or nine more days. Okay, they don't have to worry about putting them in. I mean, no, know, I'm going to just. They're not going to drop out. No, they'll be all right. I'm going to cover the nest. I'm going to just take one last look under here. The nest is not wet. Sometimes you'll get so many maggots in there. When the maggots pee, they'll saturate the nest with the maggot urine. Oh, that's a special thought. That's a special thought mm. and a real good smell too. So pretty. So in that case, you want to you want to replace the nest. You want to just throw that nest away and then put in a new nest 
and then put the babies back in can the new nest. Can you do that? You can do that, and I can show you how to do that here in just a minute. Okay, there, she's really upset. Yeah, we're going to put her back in. probably um, flying at us, the male or the female? They both will do that. I was going to say, the, the woman's probably doing all the work. <laughs> I'm sure she is. No, it's a male's job to protect the family, so okay. you got to give us some credit. Well, not much. Okay, we're going to close up the box. And then we're going to look at these things. Then we're and going to look at the maids. terrible. Oh, right. my God, this one here is terrible. Look at that one right there. That's right. Let's take a look at these. Okay, let's, let's you got to get them. close on this. Is that okay there? Okay. Can you see okay? Come on. All right, this is going to be a good demonstration because we got two stages. We got both stages of the, or two of the stages of the life cycle of the blowfly. Well, I saw one's black and one's uh, lighter color. I'm going to explain that. So okay. that's a good, good, good observation. This here is the maggot. This is what hatches, oh. that's what hatches from the egg when the female blowfly lays her eggs in the bluebird nest. Can you see that? Okay. And if you look at this, you can see the, that dark line on the top. That's the intestine, and it's dark because there's nestling blood inside the oh, intestine that it's this digesting. Is, this is beyond what I need to know. Oh, but it's good stuff. And it's why you should know about this so that you can help your bluebirds in case you, you do get blowfly infestations, okay? Now remember, these larvae, they hide at the bottom of the nest during the day, but then come up at night to feed on the nestlings. Okay, now where's the other stage? What is this thing over here? Okay, after they feed for about 10 days, they then transform into what's called the pupa stage. And when they do that, they change their entire body and they enclose themselves with a hard outer covering, a hard brown covering like you see here. And that's the pupa stage of the blowfly larvae. So when they all get done feeding, they're ready to go into the next stage of their life cycle called the pupa stage. And so they transform themselves into this brown, structure there and those are easy to see in the nest too and you usually see those at the very bottom of the nest so if you tip your nest over and look at that that usually will stand out right away because they're at the very bottom of the nest. Do we want to kill them? Well the, the pupa stage they're not going to hurt the nestlings anymore they're already done feeding. They will spend about 10 days in that stage and then after 10 days the adult fly emerges breaks out of that case that pupa covering and then it flies out of the box and then it mates with other adult flies, bull flies, and then the life cycle is complete that way. So we but, don't want to kill them then. But those no, those don't bother me because by then it's really too late because they've already fed on the nestling. What about that stuff. other one that's in there? I didn't like that other one that was kind of crawling around. Yeah, but the megas, this is what this is the thing that you want to remove. This is what you want to look for when you check that your one bluebirds. There, your you want to see. I've come across nests that had close to 100 maggots in oh, it. Oh, come on. And that is really, nestlings that have that many maggots in their nest can suffer greatly from anemia, just from loss of blood. Wow. And there's even been cases where nestlings have died from losing too much blood. So you want to keep an eye out for those. So if you do find your nest and it's really in bad shape, you want to replace it. This nest was in fairly good shape because mm -hmm. it only had a few larvae in it. So. What I do, and what you can do also if you come across a nest that's really heavily infested, what you can do is you can make your own nest. And what I do is I just gather up some dry grass and then put it in my hand and then make a depression in the middle. And then you can put your nestlings in there and then put them back in the box. And that nest, because it's clean, you won't have any maggots in it. And then your nestlings will recover from the, the maggots that were in the nest previously. Okay. Wow. So, and what I also do is I keep, I save old nests that I come across. Sometimes a female will build a nest and then not use it. So instead of just throwing the nest away, I keep it on hand in case I need to use it as a replacement nest for maggots. Hmm. But, oh, wow. But it's always good to have some straw or pine needles on hand so you can make a replacement nest if you need to. Hey, um I know with the purple martins, they always want pine needles for them too. Pine that, needles are, yes. That's the best thing for most nests. Yeah, that really birds. is the best thing. We're not sure why they like the white pine needles. The, the hypothesis is, is that pine needles contain an insect repellent. Oh, wow. And it's called, the, the resin in pine needles may have some insect repellent properties. So if you use pine needles in all of your nests, the theory is, or the hypothesis is, is that fewer maggots or fewer parasites will occupy that hmm. nest. 
Well, the mother is telling us to get out of here. Yes, let's go on She's to the next. She's having a crisis. To the next box, and then. Now you're just going to dump that. We'll let them. Yeah, we're just going to dump these out. They will go back after those birds. There's so. no way they can get back up in the box, so we're okay. Okay, we're good to go. We're good now to we're, go. Now we're on to the next point. <laughs> Now we've moved from the, to the third box, right, Mark? Well, we moved from box five to box four here right, at the Right, the third park. actual box that we're, we're looking, looking at. at and right. why, are we, why do we want people to this see this box? This box has day 15 nestlings in it. Okay. So we really, you don't want to open the box after, you know, day 13, like I said before. But what I want to do is, if we're real slow and deliberate, I can lower the front panel and we can take a peek at the nestlings at day 15. They're beautiful. They're almost like their parents, except they'll have spotted breasts, uh, brown and white or gray and white spots on the breast. So I don't know if we'll see that, but we're going to just lower the front panel for just a few seconds and see if we can't get a, a, a video of them in the nest. How old were the other ones we just looked at? They were day nine. And this is day? Fifteen. Okay, this is a week later then. Uh-huh, almost a okay, week. Okay, I'm going to step back and the cameraman and Mark are going to do this. Okay. It's going to be a quickie. If anything falls out, I'm going to scream. Let's close her up. We don't want to lose anybody. Okay, that's all we want to do. And again, all right. by now you've checked for everything. You know, when they were younger, it's, that's when you want to check for unhatched eggs and blowfly larvae. We'll talk about unhatched eggs in a little bit. Okay, we're on to the next one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now we're at a little different location. We've filmed so much at the Connelly Park Park Park. Um, a funny story here is there's a lot of competition between Whispering Pines Golf Course and the Bark Park as to who has the most successful season with bluebirds. And we're here at Whispering Pines right now where the person who manages it is Carol King's Ed, and she's allowing us to check one of the boxes here. And we are at box number one, Whispering Pines. This is box number one, and this had eggs in it the last time I was here. And they should have hatched either yesterday or today, so we're going to take a look inside and see if that's the case. Do you think there's something, could be something wrong with them? It could be, yeah. Does that mean that the mother hasn't been sitting there long enough? Or? Well, there's a whole number of reasons eggs may not hatch. Usually it's just one or two eggs in the clutch that doesn't hatch. And when that happens, if you have eggs in the clutch after the other eggs have hatched, you want to take those unhatched eggs out of take the box out. because that will give more room to the nestlings that are there and it means that they won't accidentally break the egg and foul the nest. So you want to always remove unhatched eggs. Is there anything that's growing underneath? No, they wouldn't be underneath there yet. There then. wouldn't be any maggots in this nest because right. there's no nestlings. The right. bullflies gotcha. will only lay their eggs in nests that have one that have day one or day two nestlings mm -hmm. in it. You want to show that to the camera so they yep. can see that? Okay. Now these are eggs. They, they, they don't look good. They look bad, but we're going to leave them. Why do they them. look bad? Well, if you look close, I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not, but they're, they're bicolored. They have two colors. They have a light color and they're dark colored at the end like that. Oh, wow. And that always, to me, that always means that they're not quite good, that they're not, probably not going to hatch. Would uh, that you, be because she hasn't been around or something happened Well, to her? it could be that this is late in the year. This is, today's July 19th, mm -hmm. and bluebirds, like I say, when it becomes around July 15th, they won't lay eggs anymore. So okay. it could be near the end of the season. It could be the female laid the four eggs and then she lost the ability to incubate those eggs. Do you, well, you leave those in there now. Well, we're going to leave them in just to be safe. For we want to leave them in. Back. Yeah, we want to. Okay. If you're not sure if the eggs are bad or not, and we're not 100% sure, we're going to leave these in the box for another week just to see if they hatch. If okay. they don't, we'll just take the eggs out. And uh, and what else did you find at this nest? Well. Well, I was going to say first before we check. There's a wasp oh. nest under here, and I want to check on that in just a second. 
But again, if you have unhatched eggs in your box, take the eggs out. Okay. But wait for at least two or three days before you take the eggs out after the eggs hatch because the body heat from the nestlings will actually incubate those eggs if they're still good. Oh, okay, good. So okay. Leave, leave unhatched eggs in there for about three days after the eggs hatch, and if they, do, if they don't hatch by the fourth day, then you can take the eggs out. You know they're not any good. Okay. Okay? We're going to put these back just in case they hatch. We won't know for another, another few days or so, but it doesn't look like these are any good. Now, when you monitor your box, your bluebird box, and there's eggs in it or nestlings, you want to look for a couple of intruders in that box, and one of them could be ants. Uh, ants, especially when it rains heavy like we've had lately, ants will not be able to nest in the ground because they get flooded out and it's too wet. So they will move up to higher ground to nest, and that's hmm. when I usually have my nest boxes invaded by ants. Okay, what else? And you don't want to leave those ants in there because they'll take up residence in the box, and if the female has a nest with eggs in there, she'll sometimes abandon her eggs because the ants become intolerable, because ants do bite. So you want to make sure that those ants are removed from that box. Okay, I'm not standing close to you and tell everybody why I've developed a distance right now. Okay, I'll tell you in just a second. <laughs> One more thing about ants. Okay. <laughs> if you have ants in your box, if you just try to scrape them out, that's not going to work because they're just going to go back up and, and nest in the box mm -hmm. and, and go move back into the box. There's a couple of ways you can get rid of ants. You can take the nest out and then sprinkle a pinch of seven dust on the floor of the nest box. Oh, okay. And then put the nest back in. That will drive the ants away, no question. In about 20 minutes, they will exit that nest box. The people have also tried using have also tried using cinnamon powder. Cinnamon They'll sprinkle some cinnamon, cinnamon powder in the bottom of the box and then put the nest back in. I've tried cinnamon powder and it works most of the time, but a couple times it doesn't work. And because I have such an extensive area where I check bluebird boxes, I'm not always able to go back and check right away if this, to right. see if the cinnamon works. So I pretty much use the seven dust. And seven dust was actually developed to keep feather mites off of chickens in chicken coops. Oh, I didn't know that. So it was developed with birds in mind. So that little bit of seven dust you put on the floor of the box, and then you put the nest on top of it, that's not going to hurt the nestlings and it's not going to hurt the adults. In fact, they'll never even come in contact with it. Mm -hmm. And seven dust is kind of neat because it only has a half-life of a few days, so in three or four days it becomes essentially inert. Oh, I didn't know that. But even then, it will still keep the ants away for the rest of the nesting well, season. Well, you've got somebody else visiting you here. Yes, we do, and that's another potential intruder, and that would be the paper wasp. Now, there's going to be three kinds of paper wasp that will want to nest in your bluebird box. One is the northern paper wasp and the other is the American paper wasp. And they usually hang their nests from the ceilings, from the ceiling inside. And if you have a wasp nest hanging from your ceiling and there's no bluebirds in the box, they will not use it. They will not nest in a box that has a wasp's nest hanging from the ceiling. Okay, so you have to remove that nest. Right, but that isn't where this one is. This no, one's underneath. We're gonna, yeah, this other one is underneath, as we'll see in a second. So if, there, if the wasp's nest is on the ceiling inside, you want to get rid of that wasp's nest, mm -hmm. especially if it's the American or Northern paper wasp. And, mm -hmm. uh, but if you do have a wasp nest in your ceiling, and it's our native wasp, I don't like to kill our native wasp because they're very beneficial. So here's how I remove the wasp nest. And there's usually going to be a queen on that nest. But wait a minute, is there on. a wasp nest in the, in the roof of this? No, it's not that. Oh, the wasp nest underneath. in here is underneath. Okay. And that's kind of, and I'll show you. Sometimes they will build underneath where the door is, and that usually doesn't cause a problem because the bluebirds don't care if they're nesting mm -hmm. underneath the, uh, the box. But, but if they do nest inside your nest box, you've got to get that wasp nest out or your bluebirds won't nest in the box. So if there's a wasp nest in there on the ceiling and there's a wasp guarding it, here's my method of getting rid of it without harming them. I will reach in like this with an old shirt or a towel wrapped around my hand. I'll reach in, grab the nest, walk a few ways away, and fling the wasp in the nest that way. And 
I've done this for 26 years and I've never had a flung wasp fly back and sting me. They just keep flying away. I don't believe you, but that's why I'll stay over here when you're messing <laughs> with wasps. I see that. So okay. So that's how I closer to the camera. That's now. how I remove the American and the northern paper wasps, okay. our native wasps, which are beneficial. Okay. Put the nest back in. I'll put the nest back in. Yep. Okay, now we have a different, we have our third species of wasp nesting underneath the box. And the one that's under there now is a, is a wasp that was found in North America around 1981 in the Boston area. That's where they were first observed. It's called the European paper wasp because it's from Europe. Somehow it made its way over here, we're not sure how. But this wasp is much more aggressive and more likely to sting than our native wasps, which are relatively docile. Will they also go up into the baffling area there? They will sometimes nest up in the in baffle. There. Yeah. Uh, but it's very rare. I've only seen them nest in, in these PVC baffles once or twice mm -hmm. in 26 years. It's very rare. They like to actually go into their nest from the top. So this cap makes this baffle kind of not ideal oh, okay. for them to nest in, which is why the, I like using the PVC baffles. Are you baffles. gonna take this wasp nest off We're gonna take this wasp nest off and hopefully we'll get a real live wasp in there oh, so that we can yes. see that, what it looks like. I won't be standing very close then. I hope so because you're gonna learn something. No, I don't wanna get stung. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of them on there, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, Sue. These European paper wasps are much more aggressive than our native wasps, and they will sting you if they get the chance. And you think I'm going to stand close to them? That's not going to happen. Well, all You're right, you stay ahead. right there. I'm you stay right safe. Here. I'll get them if I can. Oh, he's nuts. Holy moly, there's one right there. <laughs> You're going to get stung, and when you do, I'm not taking you to the hospital. <laughs> I think we should let them there. Okay, now, the European paper wasp, you don't want to release. You want to destroy them because they're not native to this country and they're actually, we now believe that the presence of these European paper wasps are causing the decline of our native wasps, which are much more beneficial. You've got them all fired up now. There's about six of them over there. That's okay. They won't oh. stay when, they're, when they realize their nest is gone. Did you get the nest off? I did. But I want to show you that how you can tell the difference between the European paper wasps and our native wasps. You can show the camera. Don't wasp. get near me. I don't want any parts of them. Okay. Kevin, I don't know if you can see, but the European paper, the European paper wasps, there's one there coming out. They have orange antenna. And it's the only paper wasp in our country that has orange antenna. So if you can see the antenna, get close enough to see it, you will notice that they have orange antenna. So I'm, I'm going to move back a little bit further. Okay. Kevin, can you see that one there? Kevin wants to move away from the camera, too. Just, a, <laughs> just above my fingernail, you can see, can, I don't know if you can see the antenna. Oh, there's another one. They also look like yellow jackets. We think that they try to, they're trying to mimic yellow jacks <laughs> with, with that yellow and black coloration. Nope, he didn't get me. I think there's one still in your arm, isn't there? Oh, uh, maybe. There's one on the I nest. Don't I don't know if you can see the antenna on that one, Kevin, but they're orange. And these wasps will nest inside the bluebird box, so too. So if, if they have them in the bluebird boxes, they need to get rid of them. they got to get the wasp nest out, regardless of what it is. If it's our native wasp, release them unharmed, like I showed you using a towel or right. old shirt. And if it's the European paper wasp, you want to, you don't want to release those. Okay. Because they're, they're, they're destructive. All right, where are we going now? To the next, uh, the next last box. <laughs> All right, we're now one of our final boxes I think we're going to look at. We're on box number two at Whispering Pines, correct? Right. And what should we find here? We should have some day seven nestlings in here. I think there's four nestlings in here that are age day seven. Now, can we take this nest out and We can take it? the nest out All and look right. at it because it's, they're not day 13, they're younger, so okay. it's okay. We're going to check. Sometimes a nestling will die in the nest and you want to take that out if it does die. Uh, if there's an unhatched egg in there, we want to take that out because they're old enough now, we want to get rid of that egg. 
So we're just going to do a, just a, a regular routine nest inspection just to make sure everything's okay. We might even okay. find some blowfly larvae in this oh, nest. Oh, yay. <laughs> I really like that, just like I like the wasps. The wasps were cool, weren't it? Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> they were a favorite of mine. You always put your hand in the hole. That I put my hand in because I don't want the nest to fall out. If you notice, I have the boxes at a little bit of a tilt. That's so that crows and starlings can't sit on the top and reach in. When they try to reach in from the box, a roof that slopes, they fall off. Oh, and, yeah. I and like so, the bag, so the babies are protected. All right. Let's see what's happening here. Oh, get close. With, oh, my Lord. How, much, how old are these? These are day seven. If you remember day nine at your place in box five, Sue, they had more feathers. They oh, were yes. much more feathered yes. than these. Well, let's show them. Can you get that? Just, okay. Oh, my Lord. Aren't they darling? And they all look to be moving. They all look healthy. I don't see anybody that died. We're going to look underneath and see if we see any larvae, blowfly larvae, and I don't see any of those. Now, you're picking them up. Well, sure. You can touch them. Mom oh, and Dad don't Lord. care. And they look clean. They got a good bill of health. They feel nice and warm. Oh, my heavens. But that's day seven, and we're just doing a, a routine nest check. We don't see any larvae. There's no ants in the box living in there. Life is good and no wasps. Life, life is no wasps at all anywhere around, not inside or underneath the oh, outside. Oh, wow, that's great. So we're going to put these guys back. I might look underneath just to do a closer inspection on this for blowfly okay. larvae. So I'm going to cover them up so they don't fall out when I tip them over. The nest is wet right in here, so we might have some. That could be maggot urine. Yep, there's one. Oh, there's wow. a couple. Can uh, you hold these for me, Sue? Huh? No. Well, thank you. That's not going to happen. <laughs> nice try. That's why know. the one's in the second stage, getting ready well, for Well, they're it. getting ready to pupate, but yeah, there's one there at the top right now on the top of my hand. It's a little smaller, so he's going to be living on bluebird blood for a while. Can you see those, Kevin? Yes, but we don't want to see them very long. Are there any more under there? We're going to check. Kevin, if oh, you got them, I'm going to dump them out. <laughs> you can see the blood in their intestine there. That's bluebird blood that they fed mm. on the night before. Oh. Okay. We're going to check again. I'm going to scrape any more large blowfly maggots out. You're going to wake up the babies. Well, they don't sleep in the day. They're too busy feeding, eating. What Mom and Dad are bringing in. Now I that was all wet. It's wet. That's where the maggots, maggots urinate. Okay. Wow. And I don't see any more maggots up in there. Okay, so get them out of there. Oh, there's one that just fell out. Ugh. No, no, wait a minute. We oh, want, I don't we like want them. Kevin to see. Well, <laughs> oh. Kevin to see it. Okay. Is there any more? We're gonna see. It sure is a good feeling getting these out of the nest, knowing oh, that, yeah. that the, and, night, and the next landlord, night, as the, a landlord, I can you want to get rid that. of those, yeah, because no. those babies will sleep much better tonight without having, without having their blood sucked by oh, those things. That was another one. I thought no. it could That's be. It. Okay, we got all the wet part of the nest out, and I don't see any more maggots. And no one has fallen out. No, nope, they're all in good shape. They're all right there, nice and snug. Eyes are closed. The eyes are day seven. The eyes are still closed. The eyes won't open until about day eight. So tomorrow, their eyes will start to open up. That's when the first time they'll be able to see. Oh wow! Okay. Okay. So back in they go. They well, got a clean nest. While we're uh, doing this, I want to make sure that we, you and I, both thank Carol King's Ed and Whispering Pines. Yes. For allowing us to come over here and interrupt. Not really interrupt because <laughs> we made sure we weren't interrupting yeah, any we're golfers. Yeah, we're not. We're not bothering sure we any golfers this. or anything. Right. And if you're a player of golf at Whispering Pines, we are actually between 11 green and 12 tee is where you'll see this box. Right, if you come by. But if you come by, this is the box we're at right now. Okay, yeah, what green is this one, Sue? That would be... Kevin's getting, green, a, getting green a picture 11. of it, so you can see we're right, right. next, we're right along the golf three. course That's there. That's a part yeah. three. And golf courses are great places for bluebird boxes, so if you want to expand your talents as a bluebird landlord, Check with your local golf course and see if you ask if you can put up a couple right. of boxes or so. Because bluebirds need all the help we can get. Sue, remember we drove from your place to here. Uh, uh, we passed and went through the, some of the best bluebird habitat I've seen. That was over on North Watson. Yep, 
and there's mm -hmm. not one bluebird box up anywhere. I know. People I wish we could just know. get people interested and educated and And if they do want to get interested, they can either they can contact you directly, they just can contact, contact me, me and I'll right. give you his yep. number and you can If you're uh, close to where I uh, have boxes already, I'll be glad to get a box up. I got a box in Meadville I still have to check out or a place in Meadville I still want to check out yet. Okay. And uh, but this year has been so busy that it, it's the best time for me to expand is in the off season. Okay, we're on to the next one. All right, we, here we go, Mark. Now we're the last one we're going to check here at Whispering Pines, and this is a perfect ending for everything we've been doing today because what has happened at this box? Well, this is box number. This is box number four. Five. Or five. This is five, right? And how many the, do they have here? They had four babe. We had four nestlings in here. No, how many boxes? Do they I have, have here? five all together at Whispering Pines. And how many are at the bark park? Five. You guys, I, want, I want another one. No, you can't have more than Carol. Okay. So Take this one apart. <laughs> We have to keep our competition on an even keel, all don't right, you see? All right. Now these these nestlings in here, they should have fledged. They should be out of the box. So when we open the box, we should find a nice flat nest, and we should find some white powder on the front panel and underneath the nest. Okay. Let's that do it. white powder me is the the remains of the feather sheaths. When the nestlings are growing their feathers, the net, the feathers are first enclosed in a hard type structure. It's actually made out of chitin, which is the same stuff as your hair and fingernails, and that protects the growing feathers. But as the feathers grow, that feather sheath, the protective covering, breaks down into this white powdery stuff. And so if these nestlings fledge successfully, we should find a lot of white powder in there under the nest and inside the nest box. Okay, let's do it. So let's, let's see if the nestlings have fledged. Yep, it looks like they have. And is this the white powder? There's here? the white powder on the front oh, of the box. Oh wow! Look at that. Can you see it? Oh yes. And there should be a lot underneath the nest too. I'm going to take the old nest out. And these old nests, they're usually much flat. They're flat. I noticed that. And that's because of the weight. As the babies grow, they get heavier and they compress the nest. You can sometimes find food remains in here. That looks like an old cutworm caterpillar, which is one of the bluebirds' favorite food and a good reason to have them nest in your yard because they eat a lot of cutworms that damage lawns and stuff. Wow. So the nest is flat. Underneath, you can see the white powdery remains of the feather sheaths. Mm -hmm. I don't see any bullfly larvae in there, so I did a good job the last time I visited or the, before this, making sure the bullfly larvae were not present in the nest. Got those out of there. And because we're so late in the year, it's past July 15th, the day that I typically think of the time when bluebirds will no longer nest anymore. So we're going to leave this nest in the box. We're going to put it back in. At the very end of the season, do I take the nest out of all the boxes? No, you want to leave this, the, the last nest of the season, you want to leave in the box. Why? Because the families of bluebirds that nested in this box they don't migrate. They stay in Pennsylvania. Oh, don't they stay in Pennsylvania all, right. all year. In fact, mom and dad and all their kids from that nesting season will stay together as a family unit until the following spring. So the kids spend the first winter with their mom and dad. And that's a good thing because mom and dad will help them get through their first winter. And back into the nest. And then when it gets really cold in the winter, January comes, February comes, and it gets at 20 degrees or colder. That whole family of bluebirds will fly into the box and huddle up to stay warm. They will roost overnight in the, in the nest box where they were born in order to stay warm. And leaving that old nest in there helps provide a soft floor for the family to sleep on and helps buffer against the cold, the cold of, the, of the winter temperatures. So normally in between the different sets of nestlings, we are going to clean out the box. Normally you will. In, be, in between end, the first and second in. clutch, right. Okay. You take out the first clutch nest so they'll come back and nest again. After they nest the second time, that's the nest you want to leave in the leave box in for, so they can use that old nest to help okay. them be comfortable during overnight roosting during winter. Well, maybe next year or maybe before, whatever, we'll come back and we'll see what happens then and then, oh, wait, wait, what am I going to clean it out? You're going to clean it out. You're going to leave it up, at, up until spring. Until spring. Bluebirds start looking for boxes in the spring, usually in, in March. So, so at the end of February, the first week of March, then you can start taking your old nests out. Okay, and clean and it that out. Make, and that gets the box ready for the, next, the new nesting season okay. coming up. Okay, gotcha.
Okay, I think we've got it now. We did it. We did it. We, we're all set. Okay, thank you very, thank very much. Thank you, Sue. And we'll catch you again. All right.